Hey, Bowtie Nation, Joseph Hogue with the Let's Talk Money channel here on YouTube. I want to welcome you. Thank you for being here for another one of these informal quick take videos to answer some of your questions on the markets, cover some of the news we're seeing, and really just take advantage of some of those opportunities that we're seeing. And, and while I don't think the worst is over here, I do think you can start looking at some of those stocks that are going to be your best investments over the next decades. And that's exactly what we're going to do today. Okay, we're going to cover my five favorite cheap stocks, the best stocks you can buy for those higher returns. Covered those dividend stocks last Thursday, those stocks for the cash flow and survivable companies uh, that are going to be there throughout this whole thing. We covered tech stocks last, uh, last Tuesday, the tech stocks that could actually benefit from the whole stay-at-home, shelter-in-place environment. Now today, I want to cover stocks that are trading way under their fair value and could produce a conservative returns of 40% or more over the next year. In fact, the average analyst estimates on these five stocks that I'm going to talk about today are over 80% returns over the next year for the group and a few that could go triple digit in less than a year. Okay, That's 100% return or better from where they're trading at now. So I'm going to be putting, actually going to be putting all five of these stocks in my Weeble paper portfolio to watch and start making a series of investments at each uh, as that market tries to find a bottom. You know, I love the paper portfolio there on Weeble, kind of a stock simulator. It lets me test out strategies and, and stock ideas before putting real money behind them. So I'll leave a link to that in the video description below. Now, what I'm going to be looking at for these stocks is, uh, so we talked about in last Thursday's video, kind of how to look at the balance sheet, how to look at the income statement to find those, those survivable companies, okay? The, the companies with the balance sheet strength, that's the cash on hand and the low debt to be able to survive uh, however long this lasts. So very important, check that out. And I'm not going to be co going over those, um, those measures again. I'll just kind of talk about what we're looking at in addition to those in, for these cheap stocks. But so I'm going to add a link to uh, to that video in the video description below. Make sure you check that out because if nothing else, it's a great tutorial on what I look for within the balance sheet, within the income statement to uh, to find great survivable companies. Okay, for these cheap stocks, I'm really looking at companies that have been hit hard during this crash, uh, as well as maybe even before the crash. So so some some lingering problems bef from before that. Uh, but have a competitive competitive advantage, okay? That's really going to be the key here, okay? Uh, these companies that either have some kind of a, an advantage in their industry, whether it be the size of their company, uh, the financial flexibility they have, or some kind of asset or positioning in their industry. And we'll talk about that with each company that we'll look at, uh, what I see in it. Now, there's going to be lots of risks here, okay? These are going to be much riskier than those dividend plays that, that have the, the cash flow and the cash on hand to pay those dividends and the balance sheet survivability. Uh, it's also going to be riskier than the tech stocks that we looked at last Tuesday, where uh, they might actually be benefiting from this shelter and space, uh, sh shelter in place environment. So, uh, lots of revenue problems, lots of uh, earnings problems, probably with these companies. Uh, so, there are going to be some risks, but I think with those competitive advantages, uh, they do have the survivability to to outlast some of the other weaker uh, firms, some of the other weaker companies in their industry and write out that short-term pain for some really nice profits ahead. Now, those of you in the nation will remember, I recommended Eldorado Gold, ticker EGO, at the height of its problems with the Greek government last April, when shares were right around 450 a share. Gold miners were already being shook out uh, from low gold prices at the time anyway, and Eldorado just had even more problems with, the, with its uh, permitting problems with the Greek government. But it has it had a position, it had, had a competitive advantage as a low-cost producer in the space and was trading way under the value of its reserves. So I recommended the shares and they shot up to 920 in August on a, that change in government and reached nearly $10 a share, share later on in the year. So that's really what I'm going to be looking for with these companies, okay? That competitive advantage and that, uh, that under, under, share, under fair value discount, okay? Now, what I'm not looking at quite yet, okay, and we get a lot of questions in the Facebook group about this, is those travel and tourism stocks, okay, the travel, the, the cruise lines, the car rentals, the hotels, uh, the airlines, those kinds of stocks. So lots of questions on these, like I said, and I'm planning on a video on when to invest and into which, but we're not quite there yet because... I think even after we top off that, uh, you know, that that virus infection rate, right? So as we start seeing the uh, the, the case loads, the cases each day top off and uh, and even come down, we're still going to be having those uh, those shelter in place, 
those uh, those travel restrictions and things like that. So I think even after the uh, the market bottoms out and a lot of these other stocks and a lot of these other industries and sectors start to rebound, we're still going to see a lot of weakness in those travel and tourism stocks. So I think that's one that you want to wait on. Uh, focus instead on, like I said, those dividend stocks that we covered last Thursday, the tech names that are actually going to benefit from this, and then these uh, these high growth stocks that have that competitive advantage. Okay, so let's get to it though, because I'm excited about these five stocks, right? I already own a couple and I'm going to be tracking the others in that Webull stock simulator, like we said, to, to add a position in all five. So our first pick here is Teva Pharmaceuticals, ticker TEVA. And this one's down 35% from its February high and way down over the last few years on, on really a bunch of factors. So that's high debt load, weak generic sales, and recent legal risks around the opioids. Okay, so Teva had this, uh, this growth by acquisition business model, which a lot of the pharmaceutical companies did. Basically, it took on tons and tons of debt to buy other companies and really grow through that acquisition. Well, what happened is when generic sales, sales of generic drugs uh, started falling in the U.S. And, and in developed markets, then that really hit the, uh, hit the case for this, uh, for this growth by acquisition strategy. They were left with lower than expected sales and a high debt load. So that brought the shares down. And then, of course, we had the, uh, the legal risks around the opi opioid legislation. But I think Teva has a real competitive advantage here. First in its size, you know, one in nine generic drugs in the United States is filled by Teva, and it's the largest generic drug maker in the world. Uh, it's also got a strong pipeline in its own branded drugs as well, and a, an aggressive restructuring program that's cut three billion dollars in annual expenses and, and really sold off a lot of its unprofitable drugs. Right, so it's turning the corner on that debt load. Uh, it's becoming more profitable. And this is one that's not going to, uh, there's no existential risk of, of bankruptcy with this one. You know, it's got a decent cash, cash position and, uh, and definitely that size to survive through this. Sales of U.S. generic drugs have stabilized over the last year, and it's lowered its debt by about $8 billion in that restructuring program. Uh, they've got enough cash flow to cover their debt over the next year or two at least, and the opioid lawsuits are being settled. You know, before the whole coronavirus uh, uh, issue came up, then we started to see the states settling those, those lawsuits, so that's coming off the table as well. There's obviously still some risk uh, with that opioid legislation, but it's not existential risk like it was. Teva was actually on the way back up, doubling its share price to $13.20 in February before all this hit, and, and I think could easily make a run for $15 over the next year. And in fact, we can see 11 analysts here with price targets from $7 on the low side to $16 a share over the next year. Our next stock here is one that I think could easily double over the next year or two. It's already down 55% from last year's highs and then 40% down from February trading, and that's Pinterest, ticker PINS. Now, for anyone in the content space, that's people on YouTube, bloggers, uh, news media, anyone online, really, Pinterest is an absolute must, okay? No other social media site, with the exception of maybe YouTube, gets me more views and visitors to my sites. And now, unlike uh, Facebook and some of those other social platforms, Pinterest is a search engine, which means your posts stick around longer. So this is one that uh, definitely has that, uh, that staying power as far as uh, users' demand and, and supply. Now, Pinterest actually, where it's trading right now, reminds me a lot of Facebook during the rough time after its IPO. Okay, if you remember that, you know, Facebook opened at $42 a share in May 2012 and just plunged down to $18 by August because Wall Street was worried that it didn't know how to make money on the platform. Okay, uh, then the shares surged to $152 over the next five years for a 53% annualized return, and it's still climbing from there. So Pinterest really reminds me of that because uh, all, while it does have some great traffic numbers and, and we'll get into the growth there in a little bit, they just haven't figured out how to monetize the platform, okay? How to make money off, off of all that content, all those pins. Um, you know, it hasn't quite proven that it knows how to monetize the platform, but it's got a competitive advantage and that size to survive. Revenue was up 46% year over year with a 36% increase in U.S. sales in the fourth quarter. Uh, monthly active users is still growing double digits and revenue per user is up 26% in the U.S. and, and 122% internationally. So this is a platform that's still growing and, and it will learn how to monetize itself. Now, as far as that upside price target, I'm not saying Pinterest is ever going to be anything like Facebook, but it could easily reach that, that $30 target within a, a couple of years for a 2x return, for that triple digit return. 
Uh, we've got estimates shown from 20 analysts here with a low target of $16 a share and a high at $35 per share over the next year. And just to be clear here, I don't want you to get the impression that I'm saying analysts always know what the hell they're talking about or that this $16 to $35 range is a guarantee. Uh, but these are people that spend their lives, you know, 40, 40 plus hours a week analyzing stocks. So the fact that the average price target of $28 a share is double the current trade on Pinterest, you know, I think that's a lot of confidence in the company and its business model. Our next stock I'm buying, Haynes Brands, ticker HBI. And this is probably gonna be the one that bites me in the ass here because this one has been a dog since 2015. Uh, it's now down 76% from that peak and 45% from that February price. Still though, it's hard not to see some great value here. And I think this is probably my top private equity takeover target uh, for the next couple of years. You know, This one could definitely be taken private by a private equity firm or uh, for by a competitor in an acquisition. The, it's the market share leader in Innerware, okay, with more than double the market of its next largest competitor, uh, which happens to be Warren Buffett's, Buffett's uh, Berkshire Hathaway's Fruit of a Loom, okay? It's got more than double the market share of that company. And it's some, gr some great brands with Hanes, uh, the Champion brand, which is all the tennis shoes that I wear, uh, has a number one or a number two position in its category across most of the company countries in which it sells. Of course, the risk here is just that years long general weakness in apparel, okay? Especially through those traditional distribution channels in department stores. Uh, Haynes had relied heavily on, on stores like Sears and Kmart and, and it's really hit sales that these have fallen apart. Um, now with its e-commerce sales growing, the sales are still growing at those low single digit numbers. Uh, and there's a lot of con competition in this athletic apparel and innerwear and there's razor thin margin. Now the company does have $3.9 billion in long-term debt, so quite a bit of leverage there and actually had to draw down its credit line to bulk up the balance sheet through the coronavirus period but I think this one does have some great brand assets. It's got a great position in the industry. And I think this is definitely one you can you can buy, hold it for the longer term and either the, uh, the long-term rebound or that acquisition. Now it is really hard to put a price target on this one because it's fallen, been falling for so long. Uh, still the company booked $7 billion in sales last year and $1.77 in earnings, which means it's still, it's still profitable. Uh, but also shares are trading for just 4.6 times, which is unheard of, okay? Now, I'm not investing on that dividend here, which is over 7%, but could be in danger of being cut to protect the cash flow. Uh, but this could easily be a $12 stock here with either a, a seven times PE multiple or as that private equity target. And we have targets here from eight analysts with a low of $6.50 a share and a high target of $16 a share. And I know a lot of analysts have dropped their coverage to hide bad calls on the stock, but I gotta believe there's eventually gonna be a strong turnaround for HBI. Our next stock is another high risk, high return play with Groupon, ticker GRPN, and this is actually another one that screams takeover target to me. Okay, shares are down to a third of their February trade, and not down a third like the rest of the market, but down to a third, uh, and have really done nothing for five years. And Groupon actually disappointed largely with its fourth quarter sales and dropped its good mar goods marketplace altogether. Okay, it just completely dropped out of that, that side of the business. Uh, pretty much everything was ugly in this earnings report and the shares just got destroyed in the process. Uh, and then of course this coronavirus, which is locking everyone down, not letting them go out to take advantage of these local deals, it's not making things much better. But this is a leading company in that e-commerce space with one in five US internet users saying they visit the site each month. Uh, it's, got, it's got a unique app with a huge amount of brand recognition and this is a leader in that $1 trillion local bargains market. So I definitely think there's some value in the company, but the market is trading this thing like there's no value at all, okay? Uh, and this is really amazing what I found in the balance sheet. So I wanna walk you through what I'm looking at and, and we're gonna look at this from the perspective of a buyout acquisition, okay? So if I wanted to acquire this company or take it private, you know, I'd want to find something called the enterprise value, okay? That's the value of the share shares, so the market cap of the company right now, the value of all the shares in the market, minus cash, and then adding back debt, okay? And why we do this is because, okay, we've got the market value of the shares, but if you're gonna buy that, you're gonna get all the cash on the books, uh, but then you're also gonna have to take all that debt. You're gonna have to pay off, take responsibility for that debt. So what you do, you take the market value of the shares minus the cash, because that's gonna be a payback once you buy those shares, uh, and then add back the debt that you're gonna owe. So now if we look at a group on here, the market cap is about $550 million, but the company has $750 million in cash on the balance sheet 
and 330 million in debt. Now, if I'm buying the company, I could pay that 550 million in, for the shares, be responsible for the 350 million in debt. So that's gonna be a total cost of 880 million. But then I get to keep that $750 million in cash. That means the actual cost of acquiring this company is just $110 million. So for that $110 million, we get a company that sells $2.2 billion a year and produces $90 million in earnings before interest, taxes, and depreciation. Okay, so, so basically you're earning uh, almost half of the value of the company in EBITDA each year. Now, of course, you're not going to be able to acquire this company for what it's trading at in the market. Somebody that would want to come in and acquire these shares or acquire this company would have to pay, pay a premium. But even on a hefty premium, this can, thing could be a steal for any private equity firm or any company that, that just wants that solid brand in e-commerce. Now, so I like Groupon at least up to $2 a share, which would be 100% return, a triple digit return. I think the buy bias could be upwards of $3 a share. And even on that lower estimate, though, that's 100% gain on the current trade. So Groupon is another one here that the average analyst price target is 100% gain on the current price. Uh, seven analysts here with targets from $1.50 a share all the way up to $2.90 per share. So I think the balance sheet strength and that platform value is really evidence on all of this. Our next stock to buy here is Capital One Financial, ticker COF. And this one is 58% down from its 52-week high in January and actually down to 2011 prices. So nine years of the stock wiped out right here. Okay, I've been negative on financials for the last couple of months because it is just so hard to make money as a lending institution when uh, long-term rates are so low. Okay, so obviously banks take your deposits, they, uh, they pay you that interest on those short-term rates, and then they lend it out at the longer term, collecting that spread, the difference between short-term and long-term rates. Well, what happens with a lot of these is that uh, when the yield curve flattens is that the short term rates are pretty much the same as the long term rates. So banks are making no margin. And uh, now what I like about Capital One Financial is a little bit more in the credit card space and some of those different loans. So consumer loans, commercial loans, rather than uh, things like mortgage loans and uh, loans that, that maybe have a little bit lower lower rate spread on them. So credit cards are 48% of the uh, of the business. Consumer lending is another 24% and commercial banking is another 20% of the business there. And while this is was not a financial crisis, okay, like we saw in 2008, the uh, financial industry was very well capitalized, very well set up. This is obviously going to affect financial companies in, in many different ways, from that unemployment to the lower business uh, spending and the, uh, the recession. But again, this is a very well capitalized business. Now, what I like about Capital One Financial is it's got a great technology platform and really probably the best virtual banking system out there. I've got an online account and it does what it says. This is completely online banking. So that strong digital focus, and it's really moved into a lot of those integrated card programs. Uh, for example, the Walmart Rewards program that launched last year. So all those online sales happening at Walmart right now, a lot of those are gonna be through Capital One cards. The shares are trading at just four times earnings. And even on the lowered outlook over the next four quarters, this is probably my favorite value pick right here. Now, of course, the problem with every stock right now is that we just don't know where earnings are going to be. Okay, Most companies are pulling their guidance and we just don't know. Even on an 80% conservative haircut to those expected earnings though, and a 10 times price multiple, Capital One could easily be worth $70 a share right now, even in an uncertain market. Uh, we've got 14 analysts here with price targets from $57 a share to as high as $145 each. So an estimate for a 28% return on the low end and that triple digit 139% return over the next year. So again, these are some high risk, high return stocks, but each one has that competitive advantage in its industry and the survivability, I think, to last through this market and provide what could be some triple digit returns over the next year or two. Uh, but I want to hear your comments on this, your questions. So go ahead and scroll down, ask your questions, or leave a comment in the comment section below. Make sure you check out that Weeble Stock Simulator in the uh, with a link in the video description below. And don't forget to join the Let's Talk Money community by tapping that subscribe button.